السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد إن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل دلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking his forgiveness and sending salutations upon the best of prophets, the last of prophets, Khatam and Nabiin, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we begin this series insha'Allah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all understanding in the deen because understanding in the deen is different to acquiring knowledge. Acquiring knowledge, reading books, etc. is one thing. Faham, understanding is a totally different thing. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us fiqh, as we say, in the deen. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the dua for Ibn Abbas, Allahumma faqihu fi deen. May Allah give you understanding in the religion because this is something which is sometimes lacking today. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give Give us understanding in the deen. Ameen. Just to quickly introduce this three-part series, we are dealing with the topic known as Tawheed. I'm going to start from, in a way, from scratch. So some people who know what the term Tawheed means, maybe know, have some knowledge regarding it. Please excuse me, excuse me in terms of going through the basics, because the idea here is to start from scratch and to ensure everybody has a good understanding, a firm understanding of this topic that we are dealing at hand. My format of dealing with this topic might be slightly different but this is something being a teacher i'm just trying something differently uh, to hopefully again the aim is that to firmly ingrain this topic within us and give us good firm understanding regarding this topic i don't promise absolute you know details regarding it because that would take a lot longer the idea is to be brief to the point and to ingrain the knowledge that is essential and to actually understand some of the principles and the foundational rules regarding this topic. So, what is Tawheed exactly? In a nutshell, before we go into the linguistic de definition and the technical definition given by the ulama, again, like I said, just want to start you know, with my own simple words rather than technical uh, words, using words, using technical words. The first thing is Tawheed refers to simply understanding the uniqueness or the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our faith, Islamic faith, is regarded as a monotheistic religion in English, yes? It means that we believe in one God as opposed to faiths or beliefs or religions which believe in many gods. And this belief in one God in Arabic is called Tawheed or is referred to as the belief in Tawheed. Yani the oneness or the uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But from right now, we need to understand that in, Isla in Islamic terminology or in the belief of Islam being a, uh, being a religion which is belief in one God, it is totally different to the definition given by, let's say, for example, Judaism or Christianity. They are classed in English as monotheistic religions. But in terms of the Islamic monotheism, which is the belief in Tawheed, they are not monotheistic religions. Because of the definition and what the Islamic belief entails as we find in the Quran and the Sunnah. So what we are actually dealing with in terms of the knowledge of Tawheed is our belief in Allah. We have probably all heard of the famous hadith which is known as the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Where a man visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh narrated that this person came who none of the Sahaba knew and he was wearing you know, bright white clothes and he was a very handsome person. So they were amazed to see this person. There was no signs of any traveling or anything on him. So they were, you know, all, none of this added up. So he came and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to be brief a series of questions. And the most surprising thing was when he was asking the questions and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was replying he was saying sadaqta, some, you know, stuff like you have to have spoken the truth, well done. Yeah? So they were, they were surprised that this person is asking questions, he's asking the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then he's also himself saying, yes, well done, correct, full marks. So they were surprised who this uh, person was actually was. So what do we find? We find that the, uh, one of the things that he asked 
the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Akhbirni anil iman. O Prophet of Allah, explain to me, inform me what is iman. What is the first thing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? He says, An tu'mina billah. That you believe in Allah. This is the first basic element of iman. This is tawheed. Tawheed relates to and deals with what does it mean to believe in Allah exactly. Because to accept and say, yes, I believe in God. But what do you believe about God? It's a question, it's a valid question. Okay, you believe in God, he believes in God, she believes in God. That religion, they believe in God. You know, just, just this phrase, belief in God. Many faiths believe in God. Hindus believe in God and so many other faiths, etc. However, this is what we were dealing with today in term, when we talk about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in a simple way, it's talking about what do you believe about Allah. To believe in Allah, but what do you believe in Allah? And this is the kind of topic, that, or this is what we are actually dealing with. And uh, this is probably the most simplest way I could think of to explain it or to introduce it. To proceed then, like we said, now we're going to talk about what Tawheed exactly means. So first of all, linguistically. To many people who don't study or don't know the Arabic language, this may not mean too much. However, it's always important to talk about it slightly. So people start to acquaint themselves with these kind of words, of Arabic words like Tawheed, Wahada, Yuwahidu and so on and so forth. It's good to know these. The term Tawheed or the word Tawheed in Arabic comes from a root word and all Arabic words they come from a root word where they are derived from and it comes from the verb which is Wahada Yuwahidu which means to, it's a verb so it's an action word, it's an action word. it means to make something one and one of the examples I found of this is to put it in a sentence is they say Wahadu Ara'ahum that they are our opinions. So when it's talking about a people, that they made one their opinion. So they had many, many opinions, these people, but they boiled it down and they brought it and they united upon one opinion. So this is like an, uh, this is an example of using the word wahada yuwahidu tawheed in a sentence in Arabic. To make like for example loads of opinions like we said, and to bring them and to make them into one. In Islamic theology or Islamic terminology, when we talk about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you'll see why the link or why the linguistic links with the, is the, is the technical meaning in terms of uh, in the religion, it means, and I'm just using uh, um, one of the definitions of the ulama, is to single out Allah alone in whatever is specific to Him in His rububiyyah, in His al asma wa sifat, and His uluhiyah. I'm using three more Arabic words now, and I'm doing this deliberately. Yes, I am going to explain what these actually mean. But just to understand the definition, in terms of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is to make one, to bring an all and unite into one, make specific to Allah alone in terms of his rububiyyah, in his asma wa sifat, and his uluhiyyah. His rububiyyah, in English we can translate that to say in his lordship. In his being the Lord of everything. And number two, we said al isma wa sifat, which means the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Jabbar, Al-Qahar, and so on and so forth. These names, and there are many also attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which have reached us through the Quran, Allah has revealed them, or upon the tongue of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because these are divine. So they have reached us. So it's also to make an... Make one, Allah, make Allah one in His names and attributes, and it doesn't apply to anybody else other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And the third we said is uluhiya, which we would translate as in Allah's right to be worshipped. He is also one. We don't associate anything with Allah in His right to be worshipped. We don't worship anything other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and He is the only one who is deserving of worship. This may all sound a bit. For some people, this may all sound, you know, very technical and say, but don't worry, like I said, we are, inshallah, in these three series, we are going to go into a bit more detail, give examples and so on and so forth, and it will become more clearer, Allah willing. Before we move on to the first category, and these three parts, and the reason why these three parts, uh, we have done it as three parts, is because we want to talk about each category, Rububiya, Al-Asma wa Sifat, and his uluhiyah, these three parts where we are going to make specific to Allah what is deserving, what Allah deserves in terms of understanding the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we are going to talk about the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before we go on to this, this division of tawheed, it is only been done by the ulama in order for us to understand this concept. 
and this is I wanted to touch upon this before moving on inshallah because this is sometimes you know some people they, they do you know raise the objection to say you know did the, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he was teaching the Sahaba Tawheed was he saying you know Rububiyyah concerns this aspect of Tawheed and Al-Asma wa Sifat no he didn't he didn't but the example is that the ulama may Allah have mercy on them they are our ulama and one of the reasons they have this rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because they are the people who make it simple for other people to learn the religion. The ulama are on a, on a different level to the common people. And it is because of the ulama they are a means for us to learn the deen. Because every single person Allah hasn't given him the ability to become an alim, to become a faqih and so on and so forth. This is why they have a high rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they, Allah through them makes it easy for the masses to learn the religion. The example to understand this is, for example, if you study business, whether you go to college, university, etc., if you go and study the subject business, yeah, this is one term, just say business is like Tawheed, for example, yeah? But when you go to study business, you don't just study business, you have subdivisions. So you will have lessons on marketing, you will have lessons on economics, you will have lessons on, for example, um, accounts, you will have lessons or you have a, to you have, you have a topic called uh, internal, external influences. These are all different parts of business. They are all still related to business, but why has this division been done to, for you to study business so that you grasp all the concepts and everything you can, these different roads, they still lead to the same thing. It is just the means or the wasail in learning the main thing, which is business. Similarly, Tawheed, to understand Tawheed, these, this, category, this categorization or these divisions have been made so that we understand our topic is still Tawheed. The oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief and what we believe regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this division, like I said, is only being done so that we understand it better. So to proceed, like we said, Tawheed refers to being one or making something one. In Islam, it means making specific to Allah only, alone, whatever is one and whatever is specific to Him in His Rububiya, in His Al Asma wa Sifat, and His Uluhiya. Yeah. So we can move on from this, inshallah. When we make Allah subhanahu wa taala, and we regard Allah as one in all these key three categories. The opposite of this, or the nullification of this, would be to say, no, He's not one. There is something there with Him, a peer, a colleague, a partner, somebody, a sharer of somehow. So that is going to be the opposite. Let me give an example. If we say, for example, that there is one chair in this room, for example. Or we say that there is a chair in this room. That does not negate the fact that there are chairs in other places. There's a one, you know, there's a chair in this room. There's chairs everywhere, for example. But if I was to say there is a chair in this room only, what I'm what am I what am I implying? I am implying simply that there's a chair in this room only. There's no chairs anywhere else. Yeah. So when we say that when we affirm for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He is one and alone in all of these affairs, in all of these three categories, then at the same time we are negating something else. We are negating the fact that anybody or anything else is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or has a share with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any of these categories. So we are, on one side we are affirming oneness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and on the, on, in the same statement, in other words, we are negating any kind of peer, colleague, any partner or sharer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This thing of ascribing or nullifying the belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what we call the opposite of Tawheed. And the opposite of Tawheed is Shirk, which is what we refer to as Shirk, what the Quran and the Sunnah have referred to as Shirk. And the word Shirk actually just means a partner or to, to participate in something. To sharaka it means to, for example, to participate in something, have a share in something, you know, be a part of something. So when we talk about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of these three affairs that we are going to talk about, in all of these three areas, we are saying all of that we are going to learn in the, about these three areas referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as oneness. Allah is one in all of them. There is no share for anything or anybody else in all of these things that we are going to learn about in these next three days, inshallah wa ta'ala. Hence, like I said, whatever we discuss in these three part series in terms of the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever all that it entails, in terms of the al-asma wa sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all that entails, and the uluhiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in all of this we have to remember the ground, the rule is, and what we are learning is, 
what we want to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we need to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but what is the kaifiya of this belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What we should be believing or we, sh- we should firmly believe about and in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next part, I just want to mention some ayat and some ahadith, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, in terms of what has come through in the Nusus, the text as we say, these are the ultimate authority, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in terms of any affair regarding the religion that we're trying to learn, what has come to us in terms of uh, on this topic itself, regarding the importance of the belief or the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the sin of nullifying it which we talked about is shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now things inshallah ta'ala again will start to become more clearer for those who are learning this from scratch or these learning from these from a very foundation kind of knowledge we all know surah al-ikhlas the foundation of the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you could say is found in surah al-ikhlas yeah what is Surah Al-Ikhlas? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد Say he is Allah, he is one. أحد, he is one. So the oneness of Allah is firmly grounded in this. Now Allah is him because the Quran is there to, to teach us about Allah and about many things in terms of guidance towards us. Because it's حضل للناس, حضل للمتقين. It is guidance for mankind, it is guidance for those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find in Surah Al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allah, He is one. Allahu samad لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And again, the rest of the ayah is also expounding upon that oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah could have said, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ خلاص done. Ayat, one ayah, one surah. He could have done that. But he carried on with this. And he explains, it's a bit of an explanation. What does Allah mean that He is one? Yeah? Allah is Samad. Allah is self sufficient. Meaning He's one, He's self sufficient. He is not in need of anything whatsoever. Yeah? He's Ghaniun Anil Alameen. He's free of any need from His creation. Yeah? Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. He's unique and He's one in terms of He is not like creation. He's not like some species like us, for example, where he, we are born. Yeah? We have parents and so on. Allah is saying that no, he, he, he doesn't have any parents. He wasn't born to anybody. Nor is he himself. He's not born from anyone. Nor does he beget. There is nothing whatsoever like him. He's beyond everything that a person can think of or imagine or anything. So this is expounding upon this concept of Allah is one. Allah's Tawheed. This is one of the reasons we find these or similar kind of ayat or surah or hadith or kalimat or words in the Quran and the Sunnah when special virtue is attached to them many a times why because they expound upon this topic of Tawheed so regarding Surah Al-Ikhlas what is the hadith? the hadith is that it's equivalent to how much of the Quran? one third of the Quran why the main reason is because it co- it's concerned with the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the knowledge of the correct belief the correct perception regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the emphasis has been placed so that the us muslims we so that the muslims recognize the more urgency or the more need there is to understand the correct belief regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why probably the emphasis has been placed upon this that's like equivalent to one third of the quran we find in a famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an, he is riding with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says that while I was riding and uh, traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, Hal tadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad, ya Mu'adh? Do you know what the haqq of Allah is upon his slaves, ya Mu'adh? So he said, I said, Allah wa rasooluhu a'lam. Allah and his Rasul, because the Rasul gets the knowledge from Allah, they know best. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said that Haqullahi ala al-abad, uh, Haqullah he ala al-ibadi an yabduhu an yabduhu wa la yushriku bihi shay'a. 
that the haq of Allah, the right of Allah upon his slaves is that they worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't join any part. It's word shirk again. Yeah? That they don't associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They hold him as one and unique and whatever is specific to them, it is only for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They firmly upon this. They, they, they speak this and they also, their actions manifest this belief. And then he said that, do you know what the haq of Allah, what the haq of the people is upon Allah? He said again, you know, I don't know. He said that the haq of the people upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and la yu'adhiba man la yushrik bi. That whoever fulfills any this condition, that he doesn't associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his speech, in his actions, then Allah, he has a right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah doesn't punish him. Subhanallah. You know, from this we find the, the ahmiya or the, the, the virtue of having sound belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah, in surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِذُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُحْتَدُونَ Regarding this ayah, just brief translation, that they are those people who believe and they don't mix their iman with zulm. They are the ones who will be in security and they are the ones who are really guided. Now if you're in security, Aman, you know, you're in security and Allah is saying you're also in guidance. What does that mean? Clearly it means your people of the Jannah. You know, your people who are heading towards Jannah. What is the tafsir of this ayat? Ibn Kathir, the famous commentator, rahimahullah, he mentions so many narrations that many companions, there are narrations to say that the zulm here, that the people who believe in Allah and they don't mix their faith with zulm, with opp- oppression or injustice, this zulm is shirk. That they don't mix, they don't have any shirk in them. Their iman is, their belief in Allah is pure and khalis and it is true and the way it should be. Subhanallah. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh narrates the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said again the famous hadith of the five pillars. One of the wordings of this hadith generally we find that bunil islamu ala khams that uh, Islam is built upon five pillars and tashhada and la ilaha illallah that you bear witness that there is no ilah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is nothing worthy of worship. One of the narrations which is in Sahih Muslim it goes as such that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said firstly bunil islamu ala khams and you wahidullah Wahada yuwahidu. Yeah, he uses this word, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now the first thing in Islam is that you make one for Allah alone, what is one and specific to him alone. In terms of actions, in terms of worship and so on and so forth, in these three categories that we are going on to. So this is again proof of virtue of regarding this topic that we are dealing with. It is the first and essential ingredient to our Islam. It is the foundational pillar of Islam. It is in other words, very close to saying the, the, the explanation you know, what does it mean when we say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah uh, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah When we say this What are we bearing witness to exactly That there is nothing worthy of worship Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is going into it in more detail The sin of nullifying tawheed We said is shirk so when we talk, let's talk a, a few, you know, ayat and hadith Regarding shirk So again we understand the ahmiya of this topic exactly The Prophet, uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran there are only two ayat in the whole Quran where Allah begins with Inna Allah la yaghfiru. The Quran is full of hope. Yeah. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know He says, Ya ibadi, ya ibadi alladhina asrafu ala anfusahum, anfusihum, la taqnatu min rahmatillah. The oh my people never despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he keeps telling us, إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ He is forgiving, he is forgiving, this hope all the time. But there are only two places in the entire Quran, these both ayat in, are in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah begins with, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ Indeed, Allah does not forgive. There is only two ayat in the whole Quran, where Allah begins. What does he say in both of these two ayat? And then we will understand even more the ahmiyah of the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكْ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ He says, indeed Allah, Allah is saying, I do not, He does not forgive Anyone who associates, makes a partner, a peer, a colleague, or some sort, he nullifies his tawheed basically. His belief in Allah, he contradicts it through his speech, through his actions deliberately, then Allah will not forgive this. 
If a person lies upon it, he will not forgive this. One ayah, the both ayahs, these words are from the both ayahs. One ends in, وَمَن يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِفْتَرَى إِثْمًا عَظِيمًا So one of them Allah says, For indeed, whoever fabricates or does something like this, he has invented a great, great إِثْمًا عَظِيمًا An absolute great sin. And in the other one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes, finishes off by saying, وَمَن يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا That whoever does shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is saying he has gone really, really far. He has gone totally off track. In a hadith reported by Anas radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talking about the kabair, the major sins. He said the akbarul kabair, the major sins, the biggest of the biggest sins is what? Al-ishraku billah. That a person associate, make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now so we have on one side, we have the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the opposite of it is to nullify in God's, we're learning about Tawheed in these three series. If we do something contradictory, let's put it this way, if we do something contradictory to what we are about to learn regarding you know, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making specific certain things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, automatically we fall into the opposite. Yeah? Because like we said, either somebody is alone on his own, or either there is somebody there. Yeah? There's only one thing, one nullifies finds the other. So this is when we're talking about the things that we're going to talk about inshallah starting with the rububiyyah remember the rububiyyah the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first category of these three categories whatever we learn about Allah in these three categories remember that doing contradictory to these doing the opposite or nullifying any of these is automatically shirk may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us i hope that's clear so today like i said we are going to talk about the first category the rububiyyah, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And although we translate it as the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word Ar- in, in, in Arabic, rububiyyah comes from the word rabb. You know, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. The word rabb it does not necessarily mean lord because it can't be translated. It holds a, big, a much deeper meaning as we will see. This aspect, this first category, the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it concerns and is linked with or is related to the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, in the actions which are specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is none of creation who has even a hair worth of share with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one and alone. Some people might think, you know, I keep emphasizing, I keep reiterating certain things. You will see by the end, subhanAllah. This is something which sometimes people think is something simple. But this concept is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept saying the rusul again and again and again. Because this is the fitrah of the insan. This is from the weakness of insan that he keeps forgetting these things. In fact, insan, they say, is word from the word nasiyah in Arabic, it means to forget. So this is, and if we keep forgetting the fundamental belief, subhanallah, what hope do we have? So it's even more important that we refresh, if we refresh anything, if we're not going to refresh anything else, we're going to refresh this belief, the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So regarding the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rububiyah in Arabic, it comes from the word rabb, that Allah is the rabb of al-alameen. Alhamdulillahi, rabbil alameen. All places to Allah, who is the rabb of al-alameen. What is Al-Alameen? Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he explained, he said, it is everything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, it is everything that we know about, and it is everything that we don't even know about. The known universe, Allah is the Rabb. The unknown universe, which we are yet to maybe discover, maybe we won't even discover until day of judgment, it is all Allah is the Rabb. And the Rabb means the master, the creator, the sustainer, all these, the owner, that he is the ultimate authority. His is the dominion. It all belongs to him. He is the king of everything. A definition by one of the ulama regarding uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyyah, it is to affirm, uh, one of the uh, ulama said that it is to affirm definitively with conviction that Allah alone is the Lord of creation, its king, its creator, its maintainer, controller, sustainer. That everything is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I may say that he pulls the strings, nobody else does so. Yeah, nothing has a share in any of this aspect. He is the ultimate king of entire creation. 
So this is what we mean regarding the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just a slight ex, you know, expansion upon this definition by, uh, um, uh, that I have quoted. That the Lord, like I said, this word Lord Rabb, primarily the ulama have said that it means the master. Yeah, the Sayyid, the, the leader or the, the, the one who is in charge. But it includes that he is in charge of everything. Nothing happens without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without Allah granting the power for the thing to actually occur. And like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. What does this mean? There is no strength, no power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, me moving my hands at the moment, you stretching, or any single part, even a hair that moves on the head, for example. It does not move but with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Nothing has in its own in and of itself any capability except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed, bestowed upon it or upon uh, uh, any of creation. He is the king, he is the one who is entirely in charge. There's no questioning him, there is nothing. He is the creator, he is the alone creator of everything, and he is the creator and he is Al Qayyum as well. Yeah? This is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the one which everything depends upon as well. He is the one who sustains everything. He is the one who provides for everything. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is our definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of His rububiyyah. Remember we said this is regarding His actions. These actions are one and alone to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of creation has any share in this. Again, maybe some people are thinking, you know, nobody, who, who denies this? Subhanallah. I'm going to give some examples to expound upon this, inshallah, and then it'll become more clear. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, we don't deliberately do it. Some people don't deliberately do it, which is fine. But people need to be educated and understand. And this is why it's important to study belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, so that we understand exactly the kaifiyah or the howness of the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the proofs in the Quran and the Sunnah? What are the ayat and the ahadith? Which, which, where the ulama got all this information from, how this, you know, categorize this rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and foremost, like I said before as well, what do we say in Surah Al-Fatiha? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allah is the Rabb of Al-Alameen. And I quoted you and I said that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu has been reported. Now he said he is the master, he is the owner of everything that there is that we know about and what we don't know about. In the heavens and in the earth. He is the master of all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Zumar says Allahu khaliku kulli shay wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil Allah says he is Allah is the creator khaliku kulli shay When he says kulli shay it means every single thing that there is and again it probably it, it, it can be said that he is referring to Allah is saying that Allah is the creator of whatever you see whatever you know about whatever you don't Allah is the creator of all that wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil in the same ayah, in the, sorry, in the same, in the same par- parallel, uh, consecutively, that everything that there is, it depends upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for its existence. For its sustenance, for its existence, is, it is, Allah is the wakil over it, meaning Allah is the one who provides it, sustains it, gives it life, death, and brings it and takes it away, and so on and so forth. It depends upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu alladhi khalaqakum, thumma razaqakum, thumma yumitukum, thumma yuhyikum. Allah is the one who He created you, He provides for you, He is the one who gave you life, He is the one who... Gives uh, sorry, he's the one who gave you death, yani when you won, that were you won nothing, and then he gave you life. He's he's the one who brought the creation into existence. Hal min shuroka'ikum min yafal min yafal min zalikum min shay. Rhetorical question: Is there anybody who shuroka again from the same word shirk? Is there anybody who has any share in all of this? It's like a rhetorical question. I Meaning, no, of course there isn't. Subhana, subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. As for those who do kind of imply in their speech, in their actions, that as if there is something that helped Allah, has a, you know, has a share in any of this, Allah is saying, Allah is bereaved from all this. He is most he is away from all this. That this is wrong, He reprimands them. In Surah Al Ra'd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a bit lengthier, Kul man rabbu samawati wal ard kulillah. Say, O Prophet ﷺ, who is the Rabb of the Samawat and Who is the Rabb? Who is the master of the heavens and the uh, earth? Qulillah. Say Allah. So it's like a question and then answer by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qul afa'attakhidtum min dunihi awliya la yamlikun li anfusihim naf'an wal adarra? 
Because some people, the, the mushrikun, they would associate things with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would nullify their tawheed. They would contradict their belief in making specific to Allah what is for Allah. Like we will uh, go on to inshallah understand. So Allah is saying, so they, do they take other people? Do they take in uh, you know? Uh, they, do they take other people as my partners, as my you know, as, as something that has a share with my actions? Although they they can't even give them any nafa or any um, any, any benefit or any harm, they can They have no control. Yani Allah is um, isolating and bringing the control of everything towards Him. He's affirming that control is only with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in terms of bringing harm. Sorry, averting harm or bringing benefit. Carries on. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Kul hal yastawa al-aama wal-basiru am hal am hal tastawi al-dhulumatu wa nur." So he gives a parable. That is the blind and the one who can who can see. Are they the same? They are not. Of course, they are a rhetorical question. Is the is night and day the same? No. Yani Allah is de- denying that any of this. They can be. Partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything can have a share in the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one and alone. After reiterating this to the people, he is saying, that, How is this possible? Either I am alone or either you, astaghfirullah, you are giving me something, you are saying something shares in my actions. No. Like the, like the blind is a blind or either he is not blind. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying. Yeah? Night is night, day is day. They can't be one. Yeah? One contradicts the other. If it is night, it can't be day. Yeah, one contradicts the other, one has to negate the other. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Are they making for Allah you know, are they making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have they because have they created like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that why they you know do they have a you know have they done an action which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is the creator have they created no so it's again negating this belief that there is any kind of association or any any sharing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his oneness Abu Musa al-Ashari radiyallahu an reported as is reported in uh, in the Bukhari and Muslim that like we said the words la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah these are kanz min kunuzil jannah that these are this is a treasure from the treasures of jannah attaching great virtue to it why these phrases affirm the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially in the actions of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we have been encouraged to recite this all the time la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah why because so that we reflect upon its meaning and we always remember there is none who has a share with allah subhanahu wa Rather, every single thing that happens, even the ant, like I said, that moves on the ground, even the hair on our body that moves on by the wind and so on and so forth, nothing happens except with the will of Allah and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is Allah jalla wa ala. Ibn Abbas reports, as he reported in, in, in the Sunnah of At-Tirmidhi, uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught the Sahaba. Again, this is you know where the, the ulama talk about you know the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa taala when they look at the different ayat and different ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they bring and they group things basically. He said uh, uh, to a companion, he said, now remember, if the whole world is teaching a lesson now, that if the whole world gathered in order to cause you some benefit. If everybody gathered and they want to cause you some sort of benefit, you remember one thing, they will never be able to cause you that benefit except if Allah wills. And if the whole world gathered to cause you harm, they will never succeed except if Allah has willed. Affirming what? The rububiyyah, the actions which are pertaining to Allah. This action we should know that like all actions is something that even though there is a high likelihood on everything, our belief is that it is all down to the will and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wills, He will save that person if the whole world gathered to bring him harm. If Allah has willed already, from de- you know, from predestiny, from uh, from uh, preordainment. Now, if Allah has written that they will harm him, they will harm him. If He has written they're not going to harm him, it's not going to happen. A prime example is the story of Musa and Fir'aun. Musa alayhi salam came to the end of the river. There's no way. You know, it's like the whole world has now gathered. Let's just put this into that context to harm Musa alayhi salam. 
But he is one of the mighty anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe the Bani Israel, they had the, the doubts and everything. What are we going to do? And he, he said, no, Allah, Jalla wa ala, he is capable. Nothing happens without his will, in other words. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carved you know, a path in the water which is beyond the wild imag- imagination. This is the rububiyyah that the Nabi of Allah Musa alayhi salam was aff- affirming. Now, yeah, no. No matter how difficult it looks, it is only with the permission of Allah that something is going to happen. And if it happens, it happens. Because this is what Allah has written. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Alhamdulillah. So, this is why we, are to, uh, we, we need to understand that this is regarding the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we make for Allah one, we make specific to Allah, the tawheed rububiyyah if you like. The tawheed of Allah's rububiyyah is that He is all this, the master, the creator, the owner, the one soul in charge of everything that happens in the entire universe. Whatever afflicts us, whatever afflicts the rest of creation, it is all with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ability and is all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at some examples which contradict this and hopefully now if anybody is still you know thinking that I'm not being clear then this will help to clarify this. Many religions for example like I said before many religions like the Judaism and Christianity in the English world for example they are classed as monotheistic religions but in Islamic definition they are not monotheistic religions because they don't meet the criteria of Tawheed. That's why, in many, in many different aspects. For example, we have some religions, for example, they believe in God. Yeah, they believe in an ultimate God. But they have demigods or sub-gods, if you like. The God of rain, for example. Action of rain belongs to this God. He's the God, if I may say. But then the action of rain, for example, bringing about rain, this aspect is for this God. This destroys Rububiya because what are we saying? We make one for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all his actions, we say he is alone in them. So the rain of bring the, the action of bringing rain or sending rain down to earth is for who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None whatsoever has any share in this, has even a say in this. None. Yeah? Whether with, uh, with regard to any other thing as well. If you have and if you believe that yes, there's a creator, but then there's all these other, you know, the, the, like some uh, religions, for example, they have uh, the God of day and God of night, the God of good and the God of evil, for example. This negates it because straight away in the Rububiyah and this concept of the Rububiyah and the oneness of Allah in his Rububiyah, in terms of his actions, it's negated, it's gone. Yeah. Hence, we don't regard that, even though they believe, like I said, sorry to read it, but even though they, generally speaking, it's a belief in one God. But because they have these subdivisions attributing certain actions which are only for Allah to these other gods, in Islamic terms, it's not. It's shirk. More relevant to our society would be, for example, this belief in horoscopes. I have the newspaper and now subhanAllah because of phones and etc. It's not as popular but in, in, in the newspapers I believe, I've not read a newspaper for ages. Um, but in the newspapers for example, in magazines etc. At the back you know there's the, there's the horoscopes. And many of people, subhanAllah many Muslims as well, unfortunately. They believe in this. You know they have, they may not com- with conviction believe in them. Some subhanAllah people believe in it with conviction, you know. And something happens and it said it in the horoscope. They say, oh, subhanAllah, you know, I read it. They say, oh, you know, I read it. In, I read it, you know, I read it at the beginning of the month. They have the, and some Muslims just out of curiosity, they read, oh, okay, what is they going to say? This is shirk. Especially it is shirk. It is shirk when a person believes especially in what is being said in these horoscopes. Why? Because when you're reading and it's, uh, let's say for example, you know, it says that this month is going to be a troublesome month for you. you know, something like this I think they used to be, you know. This month is going to be a troublesome, but at the, month, at the end of the month you're going to come out much stronger and better. So persevere, you know, istikama, and it sounds really good, etc, etc. And the person believes, it, I better get ready, you know. Maybe I book some time off from work and he acts in accordance with it. This is shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can anything happen without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The rububiyyah, the concept of the oneness. Tawheedur rububiyyah is la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Nothing happens without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also when we learn the deen, we learn whatever Allah has decreed it is best for us. So we don't regard any of this rubbish, we regard it as rubbish. We don't even go near it, we don't even read it. We don't even read it even for fun because it might be damaging to us. The shaitan is always active. 
You know, we might think, I don't believe in this, but let's have a look what he's saying today. You know, we, this is something of the shaitan. Khutuwat is shaitan. These are the footsteps of shaitan. Shaitan doesn't act all the time. It's like, yeah, you just read it. I know you don't believe in it. You just read it. Have a read what it says. And then you have that thing and then something bad happens. You think, whoa, he did say something. You know, I'm going to have a you know, difficult month. This is dangerous. Because we know everything is preordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained, it's best for us. We just need to act in the best of our actions and do what is best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a way negates this in the Quran when he says in Surah Al-A'raf وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ وَالنُّجُومَ مُسَّخَّرَاتِ بِأَمْرِهِ أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْعَمْرِ تَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ so what is horoscopes? You know, it's predicting the future you know, in, uh, from the way the stars and the planets move and the, you know, the celestial objects, you know, how they're going around and stuff. He's trying to predict the future from this. Allah is telling us, wal shams, wal kamara, wal nujum, the sun, the moon, the stars, musakharata bi amrihi. They are all under Allah's command because they are part of creation. Even Allah, they are going according to Allah's command. Why are you thinking that they have an influence in anything? No, they are not shuraka. They are not partners with Allah. They have no say. Allah is one in his rububiyyah. Another example would be, we find again common, common is to tie something, whether it's to the, you know, the hands or the feet or to cars or houses or put something up with the intention or with the belief that this is going to bring good look for example you know common one or that it's going to avert some sort of evil anything regarding this you know ta'weed for example these kind of things these are if you have the belief that these will bring good look or they will avert evil this is shirk because there is no such thing really as good look why? Because it is all with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is preordained. Allah subhanahu nothing happens without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he is giving the biggest of examples. If the whole world gathered to give you some nafa, to give you some benefit, they can't do it except if Allah has willed. And if they all gathered to harm you, they will not be able to harm you except with Allah's will. Subhanallah. This is the conviction, this is the belief that we need to add. But when we tie something to the car, you know, my brand new Mercedes, this, I used to see, you know, we, we see a black cloth, some people, you know, I've, I've come across this before, a black cloth is attached to it. Why? Because I love this car. And this, you know, it's a funny kind of thing, you know, they don't even know who they're entrusting, in other words. It's just like, this is, it's good look. This is wrong. Because you don't believe anything can happen without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that Mercedes is going to crash the next day, it's going to crash the next day if Allah has written it. And if that Mercedes is going to be something which you are going to keep for five years, and then you're going to sell out a profit, that's also going to happen if Allah has willed. This is the belief that you have. You do, the, you, you do what is normal, like locking it, having it alarmed and so on and so forth. That's different. These are practical steps that you can take. That doesn't uh, deny tawakkul in Allah or belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it's when you associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You kind of give the power, you're ascribing a power which is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The command which is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example is things like superstitions. This is one of the common things which negates this aspect. Because again, when you have superstitions regarding things, your belief in the fact that nothing happens without Allah's permission is slightly weak or negated. Because you're kind of attributing to something else. Like for example, the common belief of Friday the 13th being unlucky. This is something which negates the Islamic belief. I just want to quickly mention as well, one of our teachers mentioned beautifully, that everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us to believe in, to do, etc. Who is it for? Whose benefit is it? Does Allah need anything? No. It's all for our benefit. So when you make your, your bari from all of these superstitions and all this, how spiritually and how psychologically peaceful is that, subhanAllah? You're not always in fear, this is going to happen. You know, the black cap went past me in the morning of, you know, what's going to happen? I think something bad's going to happen. This is wrong. Because nothing can happen to you if Allah hasn't willed. And what Allah has willed is going to happen to you. This is the belief that you need to have. Make yourself bereaved from all of these superstitious beliefs. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Taghabun, مَا أَسَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Nothing afflicts you except with the بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, when we, for example, you know, going to uh, shrines and in darbar and these kind of things and picking the stone up and, you know, doing stuff like this, 
What is the belief? If the belief is behind that, now because you know this person in the grave was pious and so on and so forth, and you know if I do this because this stone is for his grave, it's a stone of his grave, or this is this is his grave, and because of that he's gonna be able to help me or something. This is associating with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is ishraku billah, because who's in charge of everything? Who controls everything? It's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So when we're talking about the oneness of Allah, the uh, the Tawheed of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Tawheed or Rububiya is that in His actions that are specific to Him, there is no partner whatsoever. So final notes regarding Tawheed or Rububiya. It is like we said to regard one and alone Allah for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the actions which are specific to Him. There is nothing and no one who has any uh, uh, share in any way whatsoever. No, no person, messenger, angel, or anything has a share in all of this. The best of creation is who? The best of creation is who? Somebody. Allah. Who is the best of creation? After al Khalq. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam does not have a hairline amount of share with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's something you need to understand, you know, to give an example. He's the best of creation, no doubt, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But even the best of creation has no say whatsoever regarding the affairs, the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence, why? In Ayatul Kursi, what is Ayatul Kursi? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that A'adham al-ayah min al-Quran The greatest ayah in the Quran Why? Because it's all about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In that, what does he say? Man dhalladhi yashfa'u in that Allah basically denies even shafa'at Because shafa'at is what is to We think of it as having a say in Or an influence in the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says Man dhalladhi yashfa'u in that there is nobody who can sh- do shafaat with Allah. Illa bi'idhni. Clarifying that, get your belief right. Yeah? The shafaat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is haq. Yeah? The shafaat of others among the people is haq. We believe in this. But the condition regarding the shafaat is what? Allah has to, one of the conditions is, Allah is pleased with the person. And Allah gives permission for the person to do shafaat. And the third condition of shafaat is, that Allah has to be pleased with the person who the shafaat is being made for. And what is the concept of shafaat? Just to clarify, because it's linked with tawheed. It is, not a, 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 um, it is not something which the person who is making the shafaat, he has or has earned or anything like that necessarily in that way. However, what it is, is a sharf from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a reward for that person from Allah. Allah already knows whether somebody is going to Jannah or Jahannam. Yeah? But the person who's coming out of Jahannam and will end up in Jannah, Allah already knows this. But to raise the status of the Prophet ﷺ, to reward him for being the best of creation, for being the biggest abid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gave him this honor that he, you say, you ask for these people to come out of Jannah and go to Jahannam, sorry, go, come out of Jahannam and go to Jannah, and I will grant it. Allah already has decided they are going to go. But it is just to raise the status and to reward because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward accordingly, according to deeds. And who's, who is more in deeds than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Similarly, who else gets the, uh, the, uh, this uh, honor of shafaat? The salihun, the muttaqeen, not the common person, those who have been worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even shafaat, this is why Allah denies first, man dhaladhi yashfa'u in that. Who is it that can even do shafaat with Allah subhanahu wa Never mind be a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is it that has even the, you know, the jurat to even say something regarding the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nobody can even say something regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's affairs. He's alone in his decisions. And Allah says, illa bi'idhni. Except the one who Allah allows. As in term of honoring that person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone and one in terms of all the actions that are pertaining to him. Everything is preordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he has told as we have been informed of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And everything is according to his will. Nothing happens. No leaf is, you know, dropped from a tree or anything except by the permission and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant his understanding and I hope that is clear in tomorrow's in tomorrow's uh, part inshallah <coughs> in tomorrow's part inshallah we'll talk about the second category which is the al-asma wa sifat of Allah the names and attributes and what does it exactly mean to affirm oneness 
in Allah's names and attributes. And then the third uh, category is the uluhiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is his right to worship. What does it mean to make Allah one in terms of our acts of worship? Inshallah, we will talk about that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakumullah khayfi.